Hello, this lecture is on functional MRI, fMRI, overview and contrast mechanisms. That is, what is the source of the fMRI signal? When we talk about fMRI, we typically refer to measuring brain function using MRI. So here's a schematic of the brain, and you can see that different parts of the brain are specialized in doing different tasks. And while we do know a lot about how the brain is organized, there are a lot of things we still don't know, like how are different parts of the brain communicating with one another? Um, how does the brain change during development? What is different in individuals with different kinds of mental disorders? And one tool that has really helped in the last several decades in terms of understanding the brain has been magnetic resonance imaging. And in particular, we have the ability to measure brain function using MRI, a technique that's now called functional MRI. Here's an example of an fMRI image, fMRI activation, in this case, bilateral finger tapping, uh, and we've overlaid that onto a high resolution structural image. So how do we create images like this with MRI? Well, when you start performing some sort of task, let's say moving the fingers on both the left and right hands, the neurons in certain parts of the brain become more active. This results in an increase in blood flow to that part of the brain. And of course the blood contains red blood cells. And what's interesting is that oxygenated and deoxygenated red blood cells have different magnetic properties. So oxygenated blood is slightly diamagnetic and deoxygenated blood is slightly paramagnetic. And the surrounding tissue generally is diamagnetic. So if the uh, red blood cells are oxygenated, you don't see any magnetic field non-uniformities. But if the red blood cell is deoxygenated, it has a different magnetic susceptibility than the surrounding tissue. And we see this magnetic field gradients induced. Now, this has actually been known for quite some time. It was discovered first by Linus Pauling back in 1936. And the reason for this change in magnetic property is if you look at a hemoglobin molecule, it has that uh, iron in the center of it. And when oxygen is bound uh, to the hemoglobin molecule, it shields the surrounding water from seeing that iron directly. In contrast, if there's no oxygen bound to the red blood cell, uh, the surrounding water can more easily see that uh, iron atom. And as a result, it really messes up the magnetic field. So here's a schematic of that uh, showing the magnetic field or B0 field distortion around the red blood cell. So that's shown here in grayscale on the left, which is showing the magnetic field around a blood vessel. And you can see the changes in the magnetic field uh, depending on where you are around this um, vessel. And also inside the vessel, you notice these small little differences. These are the uh, sort of illustrated the red blood cells within the vessel. Another way to illustrate that would be looking at uh, the blood vessel edge on and the differences in magnetic susceptibility cause a gradient in the magnetic field. So as you recall from our lecture on MRI contrast, uh, the pr uh, precession frequency of the spins is directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field. So the spins that are sitting inside the vessel will be processing at a different frequency than those outside the vessel. And as a result, the spins dephase from one another and the signal decreases. This is what we had called the T2 star decay. So for example, if we have a person lying at rest in the scanner, you can see that the uh, blood flows in, ind indicated the red blood cells here with these circles, the red indicated the oxygenated red blood cells, and the blue indicating deoxygenated red blood cells. So the blood flows into the arteries, exchanges the oxygen in the capillaries, and then flows out through the veins. And so you can see in the arteries, you know, their blood is mostly oxygenated, so we don't have very strong differences with the surrounding tissue. But in the capillaries and in the veins, we see this difference in the magnetic susceptibility caused by the deoxygenated blood. Now, during neuronal activity, it turns out the blood flow actually increases so much that it pushes out the deoxygenated blood, and we actually have an increase in the oxygenation within the tissue. So as a result of that, the gradients, the differences in magnetic susceptibility with the surrounding tissue decreases. And as a result, we have an increase in the MRI signal. So let's recap. During activation, we have an increase in the blood flow that pushes out the deoxygenated blood. So we have less of the uh, things that are distorting the magnetic field. And in contrast, during rest, we have uh, differences in magnetic susceptibility due to the oxygenation of the blood. Uh, causing a slightly lower signal. So the change in the signal we can write as an equation shown right here is the difference in the, um, we see changes in the magnetization as well as in the relaxation rate. 
And importantly, the percent signal change is directly proportional to the change in the relaxation rate. That's kind of what's illustrated here, is that as the blood, uh, as we see the decrease in the deoxyhemoglobin, uh, the signal decays a bit more slowly and we see an increase in the MRI signal. So this is what's called the blood oxygenation level dependent or bold signal. That is, if we have an increase in the task, you have an increase in the blood flow, that decreases the deoxygenated blood, which results in an increase in the MRI signal. Now, another way to illustrate that is with the schematic here. This uh, box right here, the change in blood flow and oxygenation, we call the hemodynamics. Uh, they actually are a little bit more complicated than I was discussing earlier. That is, in addition to increases in blood flow, we also have increases in blood volume. That actually causes more of that deoxygenated blood to still stick around. In addition, we also have an increase in the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen usage, or CMRO2. That is, more of the oxygen is being used up, producing deoxygenated blood. However, the blood flow increase is still so much that it overcomes these other, and we still get a net decrease in the deoxyhemoglobin, leading to an increase in the MRI signal. So one question is, why does the blood flow increase so much? Well, one thought initially was perhaps it's the need for other nutrients, such as glucose. Well, it turns out that the blood flow still increases more than the need for glucose or other nutrients. Another theory that was uh, floated around early in fMRI is perhaps it has to do with the spatial control of blood flow. That is, we are watering the garden for the sake of one flower. Perhaps the control of the blood flow is further upstream than the activation, leading to a greater blood flow increase in areas that are not activated. However, studies have shown regulation at the columnar level. Finally, another model that has been proposed is the oxygen limitation model from Rick Buxton in 1997. The idea here is that perhaps the way that the uh, oxygen is delivered to the cells is through a concentration gradient. And therefore, in order to drive more oxygen into the tissue, you have to raise the oxygen concentration in the blood vessels. So in summary, we can detect changes, in particular increases in the MRI signal when a person starts performing the task. And importantly, this is due to the decrease in the amount of 